Hi everyone, I'm James Bennett. I work at Esri, a software, um, a spatial analytics company. We've been making software for over 30 years and some of our code is still in production today. Some of our original code is. While we've been successful using uh, refactoring tools on our modern code base, we've had challenges deploying tools to our legacy code base. And there's not a lot of information on these challenges these challenges, so today I'm gonna to try to fill in that gap. Oh, hmm. Okay. Uh, to give you an overview of the talk, we're gonna start with a summary of lib tooling, and then we'll describe the problems that come with deploying automated refactoring tools on legacy code bases. And then we'll go over a particular tool that I think is especially useful on a legacy code base. Uh, LibTooling is a Clang library that facilitates rewriting code, and you would use it along with another library, the Clang AST Matchers library to search code. And together they allow you to automatically refactor code. Now the first time I needed to generate code, I thought, that I'd write a parser. It was gonna look at C++ code, parse it, and then generate code based on that. So I worked on that for two weeks before I realized just how bad of an idea that was. So Kling gives us something really useful, which is that parser. A C++ parser isn't really something we could write ourselves. So we have three main challenges when we're deploying tooling on a legacy code base, and the first is inadequate testing coverage. This can be a, a very large problem because if we're deploying automated tools, we might expect that our velocity of change is gonna uh, increase. And we might not have a way to really accommodate that change. Uh, next, we're, we're constrained by backwards compatibility requirements. Uh, and this can mean even something that seems like a bug might be something a user actually relies on. So we can't make changes just based on what we think is right. We have to make changes based on what is really equivalent. Um, how, we'll, how we'll kind of uh, remedy backwards compatibility requirements is we'll keep some of our code kind of off limits. Now for us, we have very clear delineations between what is exposed and what isn't exposed. But if you don't have that delineation, this could be a very, um, this could be very difficult for you. And the third thing is if we have code that isn't conformant, we might not even be able to compile it with Clang. So to overcome the inadequate testing coverage, we're gonna look at alternatives to mitigating risks. Now, I'm not advocating these as a replacement for unit testing, it's just in the situations where we don't have unit testing. We, we need an alternative to accommodate that. So these are really methods of last resort. So if we're making a change that isn't intended to modify the behavior of a program, we can rely on binary diffing to verify the correctness of those changes. And it's fair to wonder why we would actually wanna make a change that isn't intended to modify the behavior of our programs. And the answer to that is we could, uh, we use these to enable more meaningful changes. So for example, Clang only accepts UTF-8 encoded uh, source, so if we're on something such as ECS2, we could uh, re-encode our files without worrying we're gonna introduce any defects. In addition, uh, Clang format is useful for um, normalizing your, your formatting, so when you end up writing your own tools, you don't have to care about formatting. Clang format will do that for you. Now, uh, just to give you a feel for what tools you can use, on Linux, I use uh, the CMP or the compare tool uh, just to see if two binary files are equal. Of course, we actually wanna make changes that modify the behavior of our program. So we'll, we'll look at, at how do we write tools and test the tools so that we don't need to so that we're, we're comfortable running those tools. So in our code base, even in places we don't have good test coverage, we're pretty comfortable running Clang Format and Clang Tidy on them. So what we'd be like to be able to do is write our own tools um, and have the same level of comfort with those. 
And the reason why we're comfortable using Clang Tidy and Clang Format is because it's already been run on so much code that we don't think that will we'll trigger some edge case that affects us. So when we're, we're writing these tests, or when we're writing a tool, we'll wanna start by uh, writing kind of basic unit tests for a tool. So we'd first wanna describe the changes we do actually wanna make, and then we'd follow it with the changes that we don't wanna make at all. Um, and this is a good starting point for running a tool called Clang Query. What Clang Query does is it lets you um, observe like fragments of the AST on the file. So you can start by writing a Clang AST matcher, and then you can look at, for the parts that match, um, what the, the AST output is. So if we just use the cases we imagined, it'd be, of course, totally inadequate. C++ has so many edge cases that we couldn't possibly foresee them all. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find and catalog as many bugs as we can. So what we'll do is we'll run our code on well-tested code. And open source gives us a lot of material to work with. Um, we could uh, test breakages and then these reveals um, the edge cases we, we wouldn't anticipate. Then as we find breakages, we, we catalog them in our unit test so that uh, if we make modifications to the tool later, we don't have to repeat that work. So we're looking for projects that we can create something called a compile commands uh, database. And this is the instructions that libtooling will use. This is a description of your build system. So CMake generates these pretty easily, and we can also use a tool called Bear to intercept uh, compiler calls to generate this database for us. The other criteria we need, well, obviously we have to compile with Clang, and we need well-tested te code. That's the entire point of using these uh, code. Uh, and maybe unsurprisingly, the Clang LLVM project already meets all these requirements, and it's about 200 million lines of code. So it's something that we could run and feel like we have um, some sense of assurance of what we're doing. But we wanna run it as, on as much code as we can, and we'll also want to run it over C code bases. Legacy code bases have many like, epochs of different coding styles. So in our code base, it runs the gamut from like that C example I showed at the beginning to modern C++ code. Uh, next, we'll, we need to get our code base into a state where we can actually compile with Clang. Now the good news is that compared to about two years ago, um, the, both the MSVC compiler and Clang are much better at solving these problems. So the MSVC compiler has a flag called permissive minus, which disables extensions. It's also called a conformance mode. And Clang kind of has a, switches to do the opposite. It kind of becomes unconformant to match uh, MSVC. And that's the MS compatibility flag and the delayed template parsing flag. Now in our code base, what we do is we go through our code and incrementally tighten things up. By, by switching the permissive minus switch. I should mention that our production builds are mainly based on MSVC. Uh, then we'll have a, a kind of like a, another b build that runs alongside it that does the, the claim checking. So we're gonna start at looking at making one of our own tools. Now, to give you kind of an idea of, of what a tool is, it's, it's very similar to a regular expression where we find and replace something. But where a regular expression matches a set of possible strings, we're gonna look at instead to match um, like a tree-like structure, the, the tree of the AST. So I'll explain that with a concrete example. Let's say we want to add cons qualifiers to any uh, variable declaration that's a reference. So I picked const qualifier as a beginning example because it's actually very hard to get this tool wrong. If we just went around a code base laughing const on things, um, most of the, the breakages that occur would be compile time breakages instead of runtime breakages. Now it's C++, so there's always a caveat to this, but let's say we had functions that were overloaded based on constness with different semantics, if we added constant things, maybe we can get different behavior. So we're going to take a look at code. Uh, an AS, this is uh, the matcher for 
uh, finding variable declarations that are counts qualified. So if we jump into it, first we're matching um, a variable declaration, and then we're gonna bind that to the name var so that we could refer to it later, both in the matcher itself and then the rewrite step that we're going to do later. To continue the regular expressions example, this would be like a, a group. Um, so we're gonna constrain our matches to L value reference types. But if it's already cons qualified, there's nothing to do, so we're gonna reject those. Next, we're gonna step up the tree to its, the scope that it's declared in. That way we can look at every uh, statement in that tree to see if uh, it refers to the variable. So um, if we have a function that doesn't even refer to the, refer to the variable, then we could safely cons qualify it. It wouldn't be very useful, but we can still do that. Now, if it does, we're gonna err on the side of um, like safety. We're just gonna like back out, unless it's one of the things that we think is safe. So one of the things we think is safe is if the reference type is first cast to a, a const type before it's used. And we could say, and uh, based on that, we think we can make the change that uh, we can add const and then those implicit casts would just go away and it wouldn't change any behavior. So after we've, we've matched um, a node in our tree, we're gonna look at a rewriter. So, is that visible? Uh, excuse me for cutting off. I think this is visible enough though. So what we have is, is a, a class that inherits from this, this uh, match finder match callback. So we, we let me see if I can fix that. Okay, great. So um, the, the run is our customization point for this. So we're gonna override the run function and here's our implementation. We're going to extract the variable declaration that we matched before. Then we're gonna get the location of its type. So let me break this down a little bit. Um, we, we take our variable and then we get the source information on its type. This is the range where that type appears in our code. And then we get the, the location, um, and then we get an end location. Now there's a particular quirk of uh, the source locations in Clang that we're gonna exploit. The source location is the beginning of the last token. So we're getting the end of the um, we're getting the end of the type in the source before the last token. Now I'm going to assume that's a, like a reference, for example, which isn't a good assumption in every case. If we were looking at references to arrays, this wouldn't work, or if we were looking at a type def of a reference type, it wasn't wouldn't work. But I'm taking a shortcut for exposition's sake. So after we, we've located where we want to go, we're gonna uh, insert right before that uh, reference, and then we're going to extend that to no characters just for an insertion, and we just insert a, a const with spaces on the other side. Depending on how you, in your code base, do references, this might create like weird white space, but this is what Clang format finds us. It will clean it up afterwards. Um, so here's just putting it all together. I don't think there's a lot going on here. For the most part, I use the same thing in every tool that I write. But what really stands out is we're gonna take a refactoring tool and that lets us initialize something on our callbacks or um, it has something called replacements. Um, when we run our refactoring tool, it's gonna apply all of our replacements to the source code. So if we, we're gonna step back to this example, we, we have a replacement and we put it into a next line, which is um, all the replacements for that tool. So if we step forward again, we use that to initialize our, our callback. Uh, then we're gonna create a match finder object and basically put what we're matching and the rewrite together. Now having these separate can be interesting. In, in my case, you might have uh, you might reuse matches or you might rewrite, re, you might re, reuse rewriters. 
or callbacks. And then finally, we're going to run and save the tool. The, the save is, is like commit. It's writing the changes to source. So in that example, we looked at something that could be done in a single translation. You know, like, let's say it was just in the body of a function. We don't need to know any of the consumers of that function to know whether or not that's a valid change. But if we wanted to do something like const qualify the reference parameter of a, of a function, then we would actually need to know some information about the consumers. And in, in more ambitious changes, like if we want to substitute a type, uh, we would no, you know, need to know even more behavior about the consumers. Um, so this single translation unit change is very similar to how Clank tidy works. Generally, it's just modifying like something inside of a function declaration or something like that. Uh, but we might also want to rewrite things across multiple translation units. Uh, so if we, if we consider the, the case where we were rewriting the reference parameter of a function to const qualify it, there might be other function declarations and other translation units that we would also have to rewrite. We can't rely on the definition being able to see all the declarations. Like you, that's what you typically have with like a, a source file with the definition and the header with the declaration. But legacy code tends to break those assumptions. So, so with multiple uh, translation unit changes, we can also migrate APIs. So in his paper, Non-Atomic Refactoring and Software Sustainability, Titus Winters writes, because of the scale of our repository, we almost exclusively use non-atomic refactoring techniques when executing large changes. A new API is introduced, usage of the old API is changed piecemeal, and when there is no more use of the old API, it is deleted. Um, if non-atomic changes is done incrementally with valid in intermediate states, an atomic change would be something done all at once without valid intermediate states. I find it useful to think about atomic changes because in my code base, we're not in, under the same constraints as Google is. I could reliably find enough time to introduce a change before the change becomes invalid. Um, there are some changes you can make with atomic changes that you can't with non-atomic changes, such as knowing if you can safely delete a function or uh, change its access to make it private. We need to know global information about the program and we need to know while we're performing our analysis that those inferences aren't invalidated. So a couple ways we could uh, write atomic changes is we could add multiple pairs of matches and callbacks to the match finder object. So when we looked at the const qualification tool, we just added a single like rewrite instruction. If we wanted to perform like type substitution, we could do something that rewrites the type, and we could have another matcher for every usage of a member function to rewrite all the calls of that onto that type. The, um, another way we can do atomic changes is we could have two passes of the tool. On the first pass of the tool, we, instead of making a change, we just record information, such as we're going to change this function declaration. And then we use that to create other, we use that to populate another match finder and we run that one. So if on our first pass we looked at a function definition and said it's okay to const qualify this reference parameter, we could use that to populate our next change, which would be go throughout the entire code base looking for that function declaration and then rewriting it. Um, I wanted to end with a summary of how I typically write these tools. First, I identify the change and the scope of the change. That really affects the design of the tool. Then I'm gonna write simple cases. Um, and then I'm gonna use a clean query to study those cases to see what information I could extract about the AST. And then I just try to, then I write my, my um, 
my callbacks, and then I just try to run this on as much code as I can to find other edge cases that I didn't anticipate, and then I incorporate that into my, my test cases. So that wraps up my talk. Okay, and, and we have ample time for questions. Yeah, thank you. I, I've had the urge to write these things, but mm -hmm. it's like there's this huge learning curve to, to write yes. these AST matchers. So where where do I go? Yeah, to why, why don't we do this? check I, the I AST matchers reference? I'm gonna I'm gonna exit full screen over here. Next. All right, great. So, so I have this page bookmarked. I use it all the time. This is a description of every kind of matcher you can have. Um, it doesn't expose everything, but it usually exposes enough. If it doesn't expose something I need, I'll do or I'll get the information I need in the rewrite step. Um, I, I actually find the language pretty natural. So in the code example, for the const qualifiers, we could just kind of read through it. But, but I do understand that it is a high learning curve. Uh, let's go on the left. So you mentioned you have a 200 million line code base? No, that's not oh, correct. I heard, I heard that number. Actually. That's right, the, the number was two million for the LLVM Quang project. I'm not gonna reveal the size of our code base. So two million lines of code, mm -hmm. you're running these analyzed, these, these two lines across, yes. correct? Yes. But how long did that take? Um, for t I'm not sure about two million lines, but typically um, this could take like multiple hours. If we were doing two pass, it can just double the time of our code. But I would expect 10 hours. So because translation units are mm -hmm. independent, mm -hmm. then you can parallelize. Yes. Have you considered doing that? Um, I didn't need to. I get enough time to run these tools oh, over like a weekend, for example. Okay, on the right. Do you uh, apply the replacements uh, live, or do you just output them via the YAML and use like Clang apply replacements to deduplicate and batch them? Right. Run? The the refactoring tool will apply the replacements for us. So we made a call on it, run and save, and that does the duplication. Although in the example I showed, I was inserting um, like into a like a single point, not into a range of data. So it doesn't overwrite anything, which is what it's using to deduplicate. Um, that could be a problem in template code because you might visit the same source multiple times and then you would keep adding const over and over again. Um, so if you have any more questions, you could uh, talk to me after or you can reach me by email. Let me put this back up.